Ah, greetings and salutations, my excellent friends. Thought I'd do a quick video today because I got an email from Lee Soo Hyun all the way from Prague in Czechoslovakia. Or the Czech Republic, I guess, it, as it is called now. Now, Soo Hyun is an international student studying tourism and things of that nature and is doing a project about Korean uh, tourism. And hopefully we'll be able to use that as a way to apply for university. So, Suyon actually uh, sent me 10 questions that I thought, uh, well, Suyon actually asked me if I'd be so kind as to respond to the 10 questions, and I said, hey, I'll do that as a video response, and that way you can uh, use that in your project if necessary. So, I have some choco muffins, and of course, some coffee. Mm, that was tasty. Uh, so I'll go through the 10 questions now. Uh, question number one. Usually a country has some symbol that represents the country, like something that people think of first when they hear of that country. For example, the Eiffel Tower with Paris. Um, and the question is, is there anything like that for Korea or that can be presented as Korea? Um... You know, I think the Taeguk is pretty much the recognized symbol around the world. Uh, but if you're looking at, like, a s destination, I would uh, probably uh, suggest Namdaemun, uh, the main gate, the southern gate of the Seoul Fortress, uh, which should, I believe, open up next year. Uh, right there in the heart of the city. Um, great shopping, close to Gyeongbuk Palace really represents the old history of Seoul, right in the middle of the new metropolis, and kind of showcases what I think is the best aspect of Korea, old and new. And I think that would be a, a great way to symbolize Korea to the world abroad. Question number two goes into the whole 2010-2012 Visit Korea year that was used by the KTO uh, to help generate some interest in coming to Korea. Um, they've been using shuttle buses from Seoul to Jeonju and Gyeongju uh, for foreigners to get around the city. Uh, this, the country a little more easier. Do you, what do I think should be done to help foreigners get out and explore more of Korea? Uh, first up, I think that, you know, re really the way that Korea is marketed to foreigners needs to be reevaluated. Uh, when you're doing things in English, uh, you know, the 2010 2012 Visit Korea year, that's two years, it's not one year, so as a native English speaker, it comes off as kind of odd. I know the history behind it, uh, and that can be in a different video as to why it's actually two years instead of one. But I think the main problem with a lot of tourism initiatives, and I said this in my presentation at the COSIS meeting, is that the marketing isn't done from a foreigner perspective meaning that what resonates to me as a foreigner to come and see Korea isn't being produced. Uh, so that there's some brilliant travel pieces put out by KTO, but it doesn't speak, it's like, oh, that's a pretty picture, oh, that's a pretty temple, da, 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 da. but it doesn't make me want to come to Korea. So what I've kind of tried to do with my videos is show the history, show the culture, make it exciting so that uh, foreigners who see it say, oh, well, I need to go to Korea. And a lot of people in the Asian region have seen these travel videos and have said, oh, well, this is definitely on my list to come and see. I never knew Korea had that. And I think it's the way that I present the information. It's with a, a foreign audience in mind rather than, say, uh, Korean um, just here's Korea. I, I try to generate everything with the foreign audience in mind. Uh, question three. Uh, I've traveled many places. What's the most difficult thing about traveling? Is there anything uh, that can be done to overcome that difficulty, such as language and so forth? 
Um, the thirteen thirty line that the KTO has established helps tremendously. Uh, virtually anywhere you go in the country, you can get travel assistance, translation services, and that helps out quite a bit. In fact, when we were going down to Jindo, uh, the the travel line actually helped us find the hotel, book the hotel for us. It was great. Traveling is also easy. Bus, KTX, train, rental car, really easy. The problem you find is that the further you move away from the metropolitan areas, whether it be Daejeon, Daegu, Busan, Seoul, fewer and fewer people speak English. So while the resources are there, um, maybe not the conversational aspects of the nuances of, of getting around within the sites. Most destinations also have brochures in several languages, uh, Chinese, Japanese, English, and Korean. However, my recommendation is to kind of change the way that they're printed uh, so that if it is in a, a language other than Korean, have the Korean there as well. And the reason why I say that is when we were down in Jeju, we went to the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum. And we were just going off the information from the KTO site, which called it the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum, uh, and didn't give a really specific address. Had I done a little bit more research, I could have avoided this problem. The issue is, is that in Korea, that museum isn't called the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum. It's called something else. And uh, once we were able to do some search and actually go to the actual Ripley's website and find out what it was called in Korea, we were able to resolve that. So having everything in English and in Hangul, or Japanese and Hangul, or Chinese and Hangul, w would alleviate some of the things. Because if you're going to destination X and it has the English name or or whatever, that's slightly different than the Korean name. If you're going to someone up on the street who may not speak English, you can at least say, I need to go here, and then they'd instantly, hopefully, be able to recognize where you're going. So uh, that's that. Uh, number four. Uh, people often think of Japan, China, and Korea are very similar. They might just go into Japan only. What is the strength of Korea that differentiates itself from other countries? You know, I think what differentiates Korea from other countries is that, number one, it's incredibly easy to get around. Everything's in the four major languages. Uh, Korean, Chinese, Japanese, English, everything. No matter where you go, it's easy to get there. Number two, Korea is small. You can go from, by driving, by driving, in a car, you can go from Seoul to Busan in like five hours. So you don't travel the whole country. It's remarkably small. And it's easy to get around. Uh, also, what I really value is that there is an enormous wealth of historical and cultural sites mixed in with this modern society, and I just find that mind-blowing. It's what I really enjoy. Um, and what was I going to say? Um, and, and it's also central. You know, you can come to Korea, and if you want to go to Japan, if you want to go to China, if you want to go down to Southeast Asia, it's a central hub. You can start your your journey here and get to anywhere else. It's amazing. That's that's why I love Korea. Uh, it, it's yeah, it's it's awesome. Um, and it's also very different than China. You know, it's um, there are a lot of practices that came over uh, during that time period when China and Korea had the the the, the close relationship, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, and, you know, it's very different than than, than, uh, than Japan. So, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, more and more people should really come to Korea because it really is a diamond in the rough, really hidden, hidden uh, off, off the radar of many people. It's a great, great place to, to, to come and explore. Mm. Number five, which happens to be food. Um, I'll put a plug for taco muffins. No, not really. Um, what food should be exported most? Everyone pretty much knows about kimchi. Um, 
Uh, a lot of emphasis is being put on bibimbap, which is a mixed rice type dish. But I think the money, I think the money on the dish to make like Korean uh, should be barbecue. And the reason why I say that is it's meat. And whether it be samgyeopsal, which is three layered bacon, or galbi, or duck galbi, duck, whatever, you know, the process of having a meal uh, when you do barbecue is amazing. You know, you bring it out, you cook the meat yourself, you have all the banchan around you, and it's a very big festivity. It's not like barbecuing back in the States. You know, it, it's, it's just a really cool, awesome experience, and I, I think that would be a hit with a lot of people because people like to barbecue, whether it be Aussies or Americans or Canadians or even in the UK. Everyone likes to barbecue, but you know, you go to a restaurant, you come out, and you have a big party. You have a couple beers, a couple bottles of soju. You sit down, you cook your meat, you roll up the lettuce, you know, throw some uh, samjang on there, and you know, grill your onions, grill your garlic. Oh, it's just a great experience, and I think that could be you know, a, a huge, huge um, way to kick off such uh, uh, a Korean food wave. I know that a lot of uh, Korea Taste at Org is using a lot of pop stars to uh, introduce Korean foods. And that, that's also a good way. But I, I, I really think the Korean style barbecue is the way to go. Uh, next question, number six. Uh, the right view of the country. Night view. Okay, so in Korea, most places close at dusk. And should places be open at night? Now, Namsan Tower is open at night. But Gyeongbok Palace, the Imperial Palace, the main palace of Seoul, is not. In fact, only during the G20 summit was it opened. First time in 600 plus years. Do I think it should be open more to the public? Um, no. The reason why, the reason why Gyeongbok Palace is so special is because while the main buildings are lit up at night, you can't go and visit it. You go during the day and while well, there are modern enhancements to the grounds, it's still pretty much a historic site, even though pretty much, well, I should say everything, but all, all but 10 buildings have been reconstructed. But it's not lit up with lights and so forth because if you had it open at night you'd have to have all these floodlights to make sure people didn't trip and whatnot and it's just not not worth it i think it would destroy the the area more than it would be worth to preserve it in the way that it is done i do like the way that doksogun has is it, no changdeokgun 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 has moonlight tours uh, during the full moons during climate weather and they give you a flashlight it's during the full moon so it's bright you're walking with guides it's limited number of people and I think if more of the palaces would do that I think that would satisfy like the nighttime viewing but uh, you know the, the main gates Dong De Moon and when it's rebuilt Nam De Moon are lit up at night uh, Suwon Fortress is lit up at night because it's really open uh, but I, I really don't want to see these, you know, historical palaces lit up so, and become a tourist destination at night because I think it would take away from the uniqueness of them. Uh, in the United States, we have Mesa Verde National Park, and they close at, at dusk as well. And every now and then they light it up. And you can go in after dark, but it's a very rare and special occasion, uh, occasion and I think that uh, works well for them. Okay, let's see. Um, next question, uh, number seven. Uh, the President's Council on Name Branding increased to increase Korea uh, as a high name value, national trade, foreigners. Uh, what else can be done to in, uh, increase the, the name value of Korea? I think this ties into question number one. Um, well, maybe it's number two. Number two? Yeah, number two. Uh, and marketing Korea with the end user in mind. What does Korea mean to someone who lives in Estonia? What does Korea mean to someone who lives in Russia, to Japan? 
to the United States, to Canada, Australia, New Zealand. These marketing campaigns, I think, would be better served is if you take uh, the way that you present the information in a way that resonates with the end user um, and, and gets them excited about Korea. You know, if you just see a picture of uh, I don't know, uh, a temple here in, in, in Korea, oh, it's a nice temple. Hmm. But if you share about the history and you present it in a way that uh, makes it exciting, and you capture the audience's attention and, and brings them in. And I think it re really it needs to be, you know, more, more focused that way. I, th I think that'd be very helpful. Um, the, the, the branding itself, I think is a good start. Um, but I think that, you know, once a slogan or a brand name is is chosen, it, need, it needs to run a, a really long life cycle. Um, the current minister said, you know, one of the challenges or difficulties in that he faces is that, you know, typically, you know, you have a minister for a couple of years and then that person moves on and a lot of the programs that they started are changed with the new minister. And I really think that's a shame because you have uh, you lose the opportunity for continuity. I think tourism is the one area that there should be a lot of continuity because it's a long-term project, a long-term goal. And uh, yeah, so I'd like to see see that. You know, pick, pick a name. You know, Seoul Infinitely Yours. You know, or Seoul Soul of Asia. Um, you know, if you look at Korea, we've had sparkling Korea, dynamic Korea. Um, you know, we have a visit Korea a year. It seems like every year there's a new catchphrase. I like to see it, you know, um, uh, extend. You know, back in what 70s and 80s, you'd come back to Jamaica. You know, here it is 30 years later. I still remember that that phrase because it was so effective and, and across the board and lasted a long time. Uh, Texas in the United States had a marketing uh, campaign where they captured the differences within the regions of the state, whether it be rafting, hiking, rodeo, uh, you know, you name it, you know, it's basically, you name it, Texas has got it, Texas, a whole nother country. And, you know, we focus on the whole West with, you know, country and Western, that kind of stuff. And I, I really think that uh, Korea could, could benefit greatly uh, by having a unified image and a unified theme that lasts perhaps maybe a decade. Um, number nine, uh, culture shock. Um, I really haven't had any culture shock here. Uh, maybe it's because I, I have spent some time in Asia. I have studied Asia, uh, Asian uh, cultures before I came. Um, but I think the one thing that I do find surprising is how well... I am treated by my friends here. I was really uh, not surprising to be greeted so warmly. I guess I guess the one thing that I do find really interesting is is that a lot of the older generations, and we're talking people probably uh, you know in their fifties and sixties plus, are really appreciative of foreigners who are here. Uh, not so much because we are here but because our relatives, and I use that term loosely, uh, participated in the Korean War. So they're very thankful. Uh, when I was here in 2008, my friends were out you know, drinking at the, the GS-25, and they told a story of, of a man who came up and uh, asked them you know, if they were American or whatever, and they said, yes, we're American, they're Canadian. And he said, thank you, thank you so much for your country to help us during the Korean War, and then gave them 50,000 won to you know, buy a few more drinks. And that blows me away. Um, the kindness, the overall kindness here in Korea just is, is so amazing and something that I, I treasure very deeply. Um, uh, going on with, uh, I guess, oh, I guess I missed number eight, sorry. Um, I guess brand name and negative views on Korea. 
uh, because people don't have a lot of information, uh, especially as it pertains to North Korea. Um, you know, I don't really know if there's anything that Korea itself can do to kind of get away from the threat level of North Korea. And the reason why is because it's media. It's the news outlets. You know, if it bleeds, it leads. And it's my greatest, greatest pet peeve with modern news is that so much of the critical thought has been erased from the news pieces. It's rush, it's sensationalized, it's just out there. You know, back in 2008, 2009, 2010, people asked, aren't you afraid of living in Korea so close to North Korea? It's like, no, I'm not. I, you know, what's being presented in the media is not what is really felt here. It's not what really is happening. It's sensationalized. You see the same thing that happened with the earthquake in Japan. Everything was blown way out of proportion and people just went nuts, you know, saying things. And, you know, it's it's just really, you know, I, I think media's irresponsibility to, you know, try to get the ratings, try to get the ad revenue from from their 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 coverage. You know, if they would just take the time out to actually do thoughtful reporting, like what used to happen, uh, you'd get some real information. You'd see that, you know, hey, yeah, tensions are still high. Yes, we're still at war with, with North Korea. But no one wants that. You know, it's posturing. It's it's way to get concessions from the West. You know, if war to happen, what would really happen to the region as a whole? You know, it would destabilize. No one wants that. China doesn't want that. Russia doesn't want that. No one wants that. But, you know, North Korea is just doing what they want to do because we'll give them more stuff to stop, you know, being like a, you know, a petulant child. So, you know, that's, that, that, that's, you know, it's nothing that Korea can do. It's something that, as a global society, we need to start help, help, uh, holding our uh, news outlets more accountable. And finally, uh, what is the one thing I'd like to introduce back home uh, and maybe sell? Um, I, I don't know. Um... I take that back. Ondol. The Ondol is flipping awesome. Uh, that is the, in, for those that don't know, it's the Inhorf, Inhor, Inflores heating system uh, that was developed back in ancient times. Now it's uh, either electric or uses water. And it's brilliant in the winter. Um, you know, you have uh, a floor, you just turn it on, it warms it up, You then it heats up the air, you can take a nap and rest on it. Um, if you're really lazy uh, or, you know, uh, really chilled, you know, you can set out your, maybe your, your house clothes or some pajamas on the floor and then right before bed, you know, put those on so they're nice and toasty warm. Yeah, undoles I think would be a, a huge hit, especially in colder weather environments. So, um, I hope that answers the questions effectively and if you uh, have... Uh, stayed around this long. I appreciate it. As always, um, thank you. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop a comment or shoot me a message. I uh, will do my best to get back to you. All right. We'll see you later.